Well, good morning, Grace Lutheran Church and School, all our friends, our neighbors. We are delighted that you're here with us this morning. It's August the 16th, 2020, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be using Divine Setting 1 this morning. This time we prepare our hearts and our minds for the Lord to come down and worship with us sacramentally, and we respond to him sacrificially in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Our first musical selection of the morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro, it is from Psalm 28. We read responsibly. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. Blessed be the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, the Lord is the strength of his people. Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Let 
Almighty and everlasting Father, you give your children many blessings, even though we are undeserving. In every trial and temptation, grant us steadfast confidence in your loving kindness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our next musical selection. Build your kingdom here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit.
The Old Testament reading is taken from Isaiah 56, verses 1 and verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come, and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in reading Psalm 67 responsibly. May God be gracious to us and bless us. That your way may be known on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the peoples praise you, O God. The earth has yielded its increase. God shall bless us. The epistle reading is taken from Romans 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people from whom he foreknew. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to them that they also may receive mercy. For God is consigned to all disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's time for our children's message. Good morning. 
it is so good to see all of you. We have some new faces, which is great. Um, in our gospel, we heard about the Canaanite woman um, and how she didn't give up on asking Jesus about what she wanted. Now, I know that when I was younger, well, and I guess technically still kind of now, I'm not very good at sports. I like to watch them, but playing them has never been my thing. Um, I, was, I was more of a on stage type of person than on the court type of person. Um, but gym teachers, my parents, all those things I always heard to not give up, keep trying, you'll get better. Didn't always happen, but I tried. Um, and it's the same with many of the other things that I have done in my life, where if you just keep trying, it, you can get better. But we also can see that in our faith. When we are younger, we're learning, and even now, as someone who's gone to a Concordia and studied, studied theology, there are still things that I have to say, you know, that's a good question, let me look it up. And that's the faith of continuing to not give up on learning about what God has in store for me. And we see throughout scripture, people who haven't given up. Abraham moved to a new place. Noah built the ark, no matter how many, he had never seen rain. All these people were saying, what are you doing? And he still built that boat. Uh, the people of Israel marched for, f for 40 years to make sure that they could still get into that promised land. They knew that that was the promise, and they never gave up. They had some struggles, which we all do, but they never gave up. We know them by their names, in our gospel, we heard about the Canaanite woman. We don't know her name. We don't really know much about her besides the fact that um, she was not a uh, Jewish person. She was not of the faith. She was not Israelite. You know, as Jesus says, he was sent to feed and find the lost sheep of Israel. Um, but she says, but I know that you can help my daughter. That's what she's basically saying, you know, but, and she has that faith, and that faith is what heals her daughter. Jesus sees that faith. So even when we are struggling, which our world is doing right now, we as Christians can continue to believe and hope in the faith of Jesus and our God who will protect us and has a plan for us no matter what's going on. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son for us. Thank you for having our plan laid out before us. Help us to remember that you do have that plan for us and that if we look to you and continue to have faith in you and never give up, that things will all work out in your timing and your plan. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our message today is from the gospel account we read in Matthew 15, the persistent Canaanite woman of great faith. Today's message is about norms or changing norms. They said uh, we would have new norms with the coronavirus, but as I watch you sit, you already have norm to your regular seats here in the church. You all go to the same places. Uh, it rains about three times a day here this season, the new norm. Uh, but we love our norms and we love our confirmational bias. And so that's what the message today sort of hits on. Jesus has just finished a major debate with the Pharisees, and again, his words are harsh and confrontational. He's called them hypocrites over the matter of what is clean and unclean. Our word hypocrite comes from the Greek for actor, and a Greek actor would wear a mask. He would not speak from his heart, but from a script. So Jesus quotes Isaiah, and he says, Your hearts are far from God. The disciples are adrift. They're shocked that Jesus would offend these Jewish holy men. We always teach and reinforce our teaching as part of instruction. Jesus then hearkens back to the parable of the weeds. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let those Pharisees alone, they are blind guides. But Jesus is committed to the disciples' learning that sins of the heart defile us, not unclean hands. You would think Psalm 51.10 would be quite clear to them, Create in me a clean heart, O God. But to change strongly held cultural norms requires a drastic challenge to our core assumptions. The remedy today is a road trip, a retreat. They literally are going to go off the map of the promised land and try and burst the bubble of tradition. So our background setting and our characters are quite telling in terms of the content and messaging today as Jesus challenges the disciples to reorient their cultural norms. He takes the disciples to the Mediterranean Sea to learn about true spiritual purity. And the object lesson is the faith of a Canaanite Gentile woman with a demon-possessed daughter, both normally considered unclean both least likely to elicit mercy from a Jewish rabbi, both least likely to know the true identity of Jesus. Got a picture for you, hopefully, here. The exchange between the Canaanite woman occurs, as I said, they literally go off the Promised Land map. It occurs in a coastal region between Tyre and Sidon, all in Gentile territory. To add further flavor to the content of the message today, the Canaanites are descendants of an Old Testament race that God had ordered exterminated for idol worship. So meet a woman who will not be ignored, a woman who will not be overlooked, a woman who will not be considered unimportant. She overcomes apostolic prejudice with the informed persistence of faith. She knows that empathy overcomes prejudice, and so she reaches out to the king of compassion. So we start out with the emotional appeal, confession and prayer to Jesus. Text says, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me. O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. This woman speaks like a disciple. 
She calls Jesus Lord. This woman speaks like a scribe who properly applies the Old Testament by calling Jesus the Son of David. These titles are key to the identity of Jesus. Yes, he is sent specifically to call Israel, but he's also sent to atone for the sin of the whole world, and Paul speaks to that whole issue in our epistle. God pledges already in Genesis 3.15 to provide salvation for all the children of Eve. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. In Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The rest of our text looks at the heart of the woman, which the disciples offhandedly regard as unclean. So Jesus doesn't even answer the first plea of the woman. He steps aside. The disciples are again tested, and out comes their trusted old response. Send her away. The organized and the cultural resistance of the disciples is like a subtle negative force field determined to repel the woman. But this isn't even a crowd that fills the horizon. It's one woman and one sick child. The disciples beg Jesus, send her away. Now, I'm going to try and be consistent here and give the disciples a break. They are most likely appealing to Jesus to heal the sick child and send the unclean Gentile woman away. That would fit with the first scene of feeding the 5,000 in Matthew 14, where they heal the crowd, where Jesus heals the crowds first, and then the disciples seek to send them away. But Jesus is not in this foreign land for the convenience of the disciples. He's not just their wandering miracle worker. His teaching moves forward, and it's a stinging response directed to the disciples, but in earshot and hearing of the woman. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman persists. She kneels before Jesus saying, Lord, help me. The Greek for kneel is the same word that we use and translate as worship. The woman is like the stone cutter hammering away at a rock a hundred times, another hundred times, determined, hopeful for just an incipient crack. The God of compassion again responds harshly. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, Jesus is engaged in two conversations, one with the disciples, one with the woman. The disciples have already revealed their hearts, send her away. Now, Jesus turns to the woman. He draws out of her heart words of faith in him as Lord and Son of David for the disciples to hear. And the woman matches the pithy comment of Jesus with her own maxim. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This is a person of intellect. She does not deny or contradict the plan of God to save his chosen people, Israel. We dare say that her faith exceeds the apostle and the scribe at this juncture in the gospel narrative. She affirms Jesus, I do not want the children's bread. The bread of the Messiah, though, is abundant and overflowing, so much so that it falls to the floor. She knows that, and everyone else should know that since the feeding of the 5,000. The bread belongs to the children, And when the children eat, the crumbs that fall on the floor belong to the dogs. Crumbs from the master's table are sufficient for the woman and her daughter. 
She understands the mission of Jesus to the lost sheep of Israel. She seeks only crumbs. St. Jerome interprets the woman's response this way. I do not deserve the son's bread. I'm not capable of taking whole food or sitting at the table with the father. But I am content with the leftovers for the dogs. This woman understands the salvation, historical primacy of Israel and Jesus as the Messiah to all nations. This Canaanite woman is the second Gentile to speak amazing words of faith about Jesus in Matthew. The first is a Roman centurion in, in chapter 8. Jesus says these words about the centurion. Truly I say to you, with no one have I found in Israel so strong a faith. And a second person of faith, a Gentile, arrives in a Canaanite woman. He calls her to her, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. The disciples hear, great is your faith, directed to a Canaanite Gentile woman. They of little faith have a lot to think about and learn. Where did this woman learn so much about the New Testament Jesus as the Messiah of the Old Testament Israel? Only one way. God the Father revealed it. Someone shared it. She's like the shepherds that first Christmas, the Magi seeking the King, the Roman centurion, Peter next week, and all people of faith. The way of God is to hide faith from the wise and the understanding and reveal it to babies. Faith is the work of His grace and His almighty power alone. And the Canaanite woman shows us that nothing trumps faithful persistence. Talent will not. Nothing's more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is like a proverb. Education will not. The world's full of plenty of educated derelicts. Persistence and faith are omnipotent because they hold God to his promises, and God cannot lie. This Canaanite woman qualifies as one as a great cloud of witnesses that's listed in Hebrews 12. She throws off everything that hinders her. Her race, her sex, her predicament will not deter her. She pioneers the saying of Paul to press on and run with perseverance, keeping her eyes fixed on Jesus, even when her faith gets no response. This woman knows a source of salvation. She is the model of straining forward and not letting yesterday's failures derail us from the upward call of faith. This Canaanite woman flexes several foundational strengths. She knows Jesus is God and she knows the promises of God in Jesus. She knows who she is, a dog undeserving of crumbs. She argues with God on the grounds of his mercy, knowing that God still has a last word. She understands amen, it shall be so. She understands Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all of us how will he not also graciously give us all things? She understands St. James. Do, you do not have because you do not ask God. The Canaanite woman asks and asks, knowing that our God is a God of abundant grace and mercy. 
One Trisha Hahn is a first-time CEO in 2017. Her former college roommate is a brilliant Asian-American woman who successfully has climbed the executive ladder in the finance world. Trisha loathes the experiences of walking into meetings and having people assume that she's the secretary. She consults with her college roommate and asked what behaviors might overcome gender bias and just as importantly might protect her from so much times of being demoralized. A roommate counsels her, not everyone will want to work with you, but some will. You have to recognize the people that are willing to engage and cultivate relationships. The wisdom of faith led the Canaanite woman to a person willing to engage her with compassion and eternity, Jesus. Jesus gives this woman the ultimate recognition, great is your faith, be it done for you as you desire. Great faith knows Jesus is Lord and Son of David. Great faith holds Jesus to his promise of compassion and abundant leftovers, even healing of a sick daughter. So this week, pray with confidence, pray without ceasing, pray the promises of Jesus, and he'll make sure that you are a blessing. Amen. This time we make the good confession of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God. Talked about norms earlier, getting back to norms. In the last three weeks, we've had two baptisms, and we're even starting to hear the comforting voice of children here in the sanctuary. God is blessing us. The prayer of the church. Let us pray to the Lord for all that we need and on behalf of all people, that he may bestow upon us the riches of his grace and that we may receive his gifts with faith and thanksgiving in our hearts for true unity in the faith, for the preservation of pure doctrine, for harmony in the lives of our congregation, district, and synod, and for charitable hearts that put the best construction on what we see and hear. Lord, in your mercy. For those outside the kingdom, for missionaries near and far, for ministries and agencies of our church, whereby the gospel is spoken to those who have not heard and for those who hear that they may be brought to faith, Lord, in your mercy. For all pastors and church workers, for those preparing for full-time church work, for those considering church work vacations, Lord, in your mercy. For all families, for husbands and wives to live in faithfulness to each other, for all mothers with child, for all children, for those who bring them to baptism and nurture them in the faith, Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, one of the many challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic 
is our concern with our school and our startup, our school and our preschool attendance. And so we pray, and we know all things are in your hands. Dear Lord, we solicit your answer to school enrollment and start up for our parents and our school and your kingdom. We ask thy will be done and ask that you keep us mindful that thy will will be done. Lord, in your mercy. For the healing of the sick, the relief of the suffering, the comfort of the grieving, and the peace of the dying, especially those we name before you now. We pray for all these. We pray for your care for them and their afflictions. Lord, in your mercy. For this holy house and for our communion upon the Lord's body and blood and for us to bear in our lives the fruits of the Spirit and do the good works for which we were created. Lord, in your mercy. For our remembrance of the saints and in thanksgiving for their faithful witness that at last we may join, be joined with them in your eternal presence. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, giver of all that is good, mercifully hear the prayers of your people. Grant us your grace that we may endure the changes and chances of this mortal world and be found worthy when our Savior comes to bring to completion all things. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Dear friends, we are so grateful for your love and your ministry of compassion here at Grace Lutheran Church. We pray that that ministry is a blessing to you. It's a question. What does God's Word say about faith and tithing? Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your life free of the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? So may God bless you, and may your tithing ministry be a blessing. We remind you that your tithes and offerings can be made via our website and our online giving form. They can also be mailed to us here at Grace Lutheran Church, 1200 Charles Street, La Plata, Maryland, or you can just drop them off. We also call your attention to our online fellowship folders to let us know that you're worshiping with us and place to submit your prayer request. All this information helps us better serve you. If you have any questions or need help with that, please call or email Ms. Andy Proctor in the church office. She will assist you. The Offertory of the Church.
truly good, right, and salutary, that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord Almighty, Father everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own last will and testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray.
this time you may take and eat the true body of our Lord broken in death for you. And now take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. May this holy body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, to life eternal. We continue with our next musical selection. May it be a time of prayer as you reflect on this blessed sacrament. Praise the Father, praise the Son. O sovereign God, O matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and far before the throne of grace, to you belongs the highest praise. These sufferings, this passing tide, under your wings, I will abide. And every enemy shall flee.
us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Again, we are delighted you're here, whether you're at home or worshiping with us here in the sanctuary. Remind you of our worship service this Wednesday at 6.30 and be with us again next Sunday at 9.30. Peter the Rock is the message next week. Also, we hope we see you during the week on Facebook and YouTube. Again, we ask you to pray for our school, pray for one another. Know that the promises of God Carry them with you in your prayer, and you will be a blessing. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. One thing remains.